as uh, Bruce said, I'm George K1IG, and uh, uh, interesting note, uh, uh, this past, in the past three weeks, I just went over 60 years as a licensed ham. Uh, so I was licensed when I was, uh, I was licensed when I was uh, two years old, if, if you can believe that. If not, well, so uh, uh, it's been a pretty tough two years here. Everybody's been uh, cooped up and uh, haven't been able to get out. We're just starting to travel again. So what I want to do to kind of lighten the mood here is take you on a little travel log. And uh, we'll kind of go around and see some interesting sites and uh, um, we'll try and bone them in here to our uh, um, presentation here. So as we start our travel log, uh, we'll start locally here in, uh, in Boston. And of course, our big tourist attraction here is Fenway Park, home of the former world champion uh, Red Sox, and maybe one day again. Uh, Fenway Park is famous for uh, being our first ballpark, most beloved ballpark, but also Ted Williams had a home run here that is uh, 502 feet out to uh, right field was the record. There's even a red chair out there where it, uh, it hit. So if you're ever out there, uh, take a look and try and find that red chair. So staying in the Massachusetts area, next thing is uh, the Boston Marathon. Um, we were able to start it again uh, this year, and I know a lot of hams volunteered for it, but it runs uh, 26 miles from Hopkinton to uh, Boylston Street. And an elite runner can uh, run this in about two hours and 10 minutes for 26 miles. So now continuing out of Massachusetts, let's stop in New York City. And the big uh, tourist attraction there is the Empire State Building, which is 1,457 feet high to the top of the tower. And it sits in Midtown Manhattan uh, at about um, 41st Street and 7th Avenue, I think. And the distance there across Manhattan is two miles from the Hudson River to the East River. And uh, Empire State Building is right in the middle of that. So now leaving New York, if we went just about due west from Massachusetts for several hundred miles, we'd get to Wisconsin, a uh, great state famous for cheese and the Packers. Uh, and Wisconsin is 307 miles high by 290 miles wide uh, at its uh, farthest points there. And 65,500 square miles, population 5.8 million, and there are 11,506 hams in Wisconsin as of uh, the last census I saw. Uh, so now leaving Wisconsin, our next stop will be planet Earth, where most of us live. And planet Earth has uh, a radius of 4,000 miles, measuring it from the, right from the center out to the uh, equator there. And right now you're all wondering, what is going on here? I thought this was supposed to be a lecture about uh, uh, antennas or something. You're showing me all this travel log stuff. Well, pay attention because it is a lecture about antennas. And all these pictures I showed that you're going to see them again because they all relate to the giant antennas of the Navy. Uh, the Navy has a uh, great need for big antennas for various things. Uh, for HF direction finding, although that's kind of going, going away now, and, but, but especially for submarine communications, being able to talk to submarines while they're submerged. And you wonder, how can they do that when they're uh, underwater? Well, we're going to find out here. Uh, these systems I'm going to show you were all built during the Cold War, and there was absolutely unlimited money. And you'll see we spent money up uh, as much as we could to build uh, some of these things. It's almost unlimited spending because there were things we wanted to build, but uh, we couldn't get it through Congress. Uh, most of these are based on World War II German designs. The Germans were very active in uh, building these things, especially for submarine communications and for the HF direction finding too. So we and the, uh, the Russians copied them all. And we stole our own uh, German scientists and kind of built our own. Uh, I'm gonna talk about three antennas, one receive antenna and two transmit antennas. And the thing about these is, you're going to recognize some of these designs because they're very similar to what hams use, except they're going to be a lot, lot bigger. So let's start here in talking about um, our direction finding antennas. Uh, in the 1960s, the Navy built two networks of direction finding antennas um, of eight antennas each circling the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. You can see there are all these little uh, the red numbers show where the um, uh, antennas are, and the purpose was to be able to locate enemy submarines when they came up and transmitted. Uh, we could quickly locate uh, uh, an enemy transmitter using this network of direction finding antennas. So for example, on the Pacific side, if a submarine showed up where that little sun dot is there and came up and made a very brief transmission, the various uh, antennas there could quickly um, 
do a triangulation on where that submarine is and then locate it and send out aircraft or uh, um, ships to uh, attack it. So what kind of antennas were these? Well, it's called a Wollenweber. Now, it's again a German design, and the word Wollenweber doesn't mean anything. It's a nonsense word that the Germans made up just to confuse the uh, a a allies. But um, uh, when we built them, we call them a Wollenweber. Uh, you know what the Ru Russians call it? A Wollenweber. So it's known by that uh, uh, worldwide. And what it is, is a series of concentric rings. Uh, so we've got four concentric rings of vertical elements. The extreme outer ring is 120 vertical antennas that cover 730 meg megahertz. So there are 120 antennas arranged in this circle. And then immediately inside that is a second ring, which is a reflecting screen. And the purpose of the reflecting screen is to make sure that a signal coming in from one side will just hit that size antennas and won't hit the antennas on the other side. It's screens the, uh, the signal so that it can only be um, detected on one side of the, uh, um, uh, the ring. Okay, inside that second ring is a third ring with, the, with 40 antennas covering the lower part of the band, three to seven uh, megahertz. And then immediately inside there is the inner O-band reflecting screen. So we've got these four rings of uh, uh, either antennas or the, uh, the shielding uh, around them to, to again prevent a signal from going through and being detected by the uh, antenna on the other side. And a total of uh, 160 vertical antennas. So the way this thing is built is, here, is like this. So looking at this picture, first we've got the, the ground system. And the ground system is um, number six copper wire uh, in a grid with one foot spacing uh, covering this entire thing. And then ground radials going out. So you can see out here on the furthest part, it says high band antenna and then uh, high band reflecting screen. So that's here, it's just a vertical dipole antenna, 120 of them out there. Then inside there is the low band antenna and then the low band reflecting screen is inside there. And Here's a picture of the one that was out on a bomb. So some of this stuff is a little hard to make out, but we'll try and show you out here on the, starting from the right side, you can just barely see right here is the ring of uh, uh, higher band antennas. And then the reflecting screen is here. And then you can just barely see in here is a ring of the lower band antennas. And then the big towers is the low band reflecting screen. Those big towers are each 90 feet uh, tall. And then inside is a big building where the uh, the watchstanders were uh, uh, working. So something like this. Now this one on Guam was <coughs> built to withstand typhoons, so it's a little heavier than the uh, uh, others are. But still, it's these things. Uh, those um, antennas are uh, within about four millimeters of where they have to be to make this thing work right. So it's extreme precision in this thing, and uh, again, it's built to withstand. Uh, uh, typhoons. Uh, you mean to make it to be, be able to direction find it? Okay, calibration, um, a series of things. For the geographic location, uh, they use the, all kinds of surveyors tools uh, for that. Uh, then each antenna, it's, it's all done in the lab to know exactly where the antenna is spaced. And then we'll get into some of the uh, um, electronics in there to show you how, how that works uh, too. But this uh, whole thing now is 874 feet across. Um, so picture you saw before, uh, Fenway Park, he took that antenna and laid it on Fenway Park. It would completely circle it and give you some room for parking too. So uh, next time you're in Fenway Park, you can look out and right from the, uh, the uh, Route 90 there down to the, uh, the buildings to, to the south, and that's the size of this thing. Little side note, wouldn't you love to have something like this for the DX contest? You know, the big, uh, uh, the big gun will brag about their four square 80 meter uh, antennas. Well, here's a 40 square 80 meter antenna for you, and a 20 square one for the, uh, the upper part of the band. So now, how does this thing work? Um, I told you that uh, we've got all these rings, you know, all these vertical elements, and the heart of this thing is this thing called a goniometer. And what this is, is a motor driven rotary switch. So we've got two sides to it. One is for the high band, one's for the low band, and the motor is in the center. This whole th it's about uh, three feet tall or so. 
And this thing, uh, the motor scans this thing. Come on. We've lost our thing here. Come on, let's see. Oh, 100 RPM. Uh, so it's going around in the circle um, 100 times a minute. And again, we're not keying up here. Right again. For some reason, things are frozen here. Let me see. Windows. Now, go back the other way. No, no. What about this? No. Tell you what, let me uh, get out of here and restart it. It's not even doing that. Let's see. No, okay, do it the, the hard way. Okay, this thing scans the uh, antenna elements. Let's see if we're back on here. I don't have to go here. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, it did, yeah, right. So here's, uh, this is the control console port on the left. And this thing works by electronic beam forming. And it's got an accuracy better than a half a degree. So all those uh, geographic me measurements and the precision they did in building the towers enable it to um, have this degree of accuracy uh, uh, on it. So when this thing starts to operate, it's looking at one half of the ring at a time, and then it's scanning around. So let's see if this thing works now. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to go in a circle like that, 100 R RPM, to scan around the uh, uh, circumference of the antenna. Now, so if we have a signal coming in, and that's just going to be represented by that green line there on the right side, as that comes in, it's going to hit this three o'clock position first, and then the two others, and then these, and then finally the center. And each of these has got a delay line in it. So this one has a long delay in it. These, uh, the one at about 2.30 has got shorter than about 1.30, shorter, shorter. Finally, there's no delay there. So if the signal were to hit just like that from the, coming in from the, uh, the east like that, all the signals would hit the center at exactly the same time. Now, if a signal came in from a different direction, say down here at the bottom um, to the south uh, east or so, it would just be all scrambled up because uh, the delay lines would really um, shift things around and it wouldn't show up on the console at all. But the operator, if it comes in from that, that direction, the operator will see it as a little blip on the uh, screen. And the operators know what they're looking for. The signals they're looking for are very recognizable. So it's easy to uh, see when they've got something of uh, uh, interest there. Okay. Okay. So they aren't used anymore. Everybody shifted over to satellites in the uh, 80s and 90s, and these things were decommissioned and removed in the early 2000s. So they're all gone now. So you won't have a chance to use it in the DX contest now. But it would have been a great one to use. So any any questions about the the uh, the Waldweber and the receiving antennas? Okay. So now let's get on to the interesting stuff: the uh, transmit antennas. Yeah. They're all gone. Yep. So uh, the one in Guam is now a site of a marine base. Uh, the one in San Diego is uh, a big uh, apartment complex, and uh, yeah, they're all gone because again, there, there's no no use for them. Nobody uses uh, AHF uh, anymore. So now let's get into the transmit antennas. In the early '50s, the first nuclear submarines were built, and these things are much different from the old diesel submarines because they never have come up. They can stay down for three months at a time. In fact, the only reason they have to come up is just to get more food because they could just stay down uh, uh, almost forever. They can make their own water, they make their own air. So, um, uh, and they don't want to come up. Anytime they come up for anything, they're susceptible to be detected. So they just want to stay uh, submerged. Uh, and we need a way to talk to them. Um, so you wonder, okay, how are we going to do that? Because we're just using RF, right? So we started building antennas and systems for this. Uh, in the late 1950s to be able to talk to, to the submarines when they were submerged. Now, here's a chart showing you um, attenuation of RF through seawater. Now, seawater will pass RF. Uh, we th think of it as hands as just being this big copper sheet, but it, um, uh, it RF will penetrate seawater. And this shows you how much. At, say, 10 megahertz, uh, you're getting about 50 
dB per foot of attenuation. So it is kind of like a, a copper sheet there. But as you decrease the frequencies, down here uh, at one, that's uh, one megahertz, and then 100 kilohertz, and 0.01 is 10 kilohertz, we're actually getting some reasonable depth there for uh, uh, communication. And the uh, solution to all the attenuation is just a lot more power. So that's what we're going to try and do. But what frequency are, are we going to use here? Transit frequency is going to be about 15 to 20 kilohertz, VLF, very low frequency. Now, this is, this is audio frequencies that we're uh, transmitting there and really high power. It's just one way because the submarine can't talk back. The only thing he can do is receive. Uh, again, these antennas were uh, developed in, uh, in Germany. So what do the, these things look like? We have different styles of these things, but this is the main one we use. Um, now, at 20 kilohertz, the wavelength is 15,000 meters. So that would translate to a halfway dot hole of nine miles long and a quarter way vertical, four and a half miles high. So of course we want to put our antenna halfway up. Uh, so even for us, this was a bit much. So we need to have some type, type of, of compromise antenna. And the design we use is this thing, a disc cone. Uh, it's top-loaded vertical antenna. And you've probably seen these on some mobile rigs. And uh, if you've seen um, uh, any military base, these things are all over. Military loves these things because they are very broad-banded. You can load these things up in just about any frequency. Basically, it's a, a vertical antenna with a capacitive hat on it uh, that um, allows it to be uh, to look a lot longer than it physically is. And it's got an extremely wide bandwidth. So for our 15 to 20 kilohertz, we're going to use this thing called a Trideco. The Trideco is an abbreviation for the company that designed it, which I think was Trident Design Engineering Company. And it's a central tower that suspends this huge umbrella out there. Uh, and then it's um, supported by a whole bunch of other uh, towers around it. I've got a better drawing out here that will, but this kind of a side view here would be like almost an overhead view. Uh, so we've got, again, a central tower here, which is surrounded by other towers, which hold up the elements of it. And you can see a, an overhead view here on the right showing uh, how the wires are, are strung from that cell tower and then held up by the others. Uh, and then the transmitter is right in the center of the central tower. And the, the central tower just sits right on the uh, uh, transmitter there. So here's uh, where we have one. Uh, you can go to Google Earth and find it. In fact, you go to Australia and right there at the Northwest Cape, this little spit of land sticks out. So you zoom in on that, and you'll see this that's on the right. So go right up to the tip and zoom in there. And you'll find, here's the antenna. Uh, and let me bring up the next one. It's looking just like this uh, diagram I had there uh, of it, showing you um, how these wires are strong. The wires are, it's a, a steel cable that's wrapped with aluminum for uh, con conductivity. And uh, the, um, the whole thing here, well, let's, we zoom in first here. The whole thing is uh, 1.9 miles across. So uh, in fact, it's kind of like a little field base site here, because up here, these, uh, on the right, these two little circles here, that's the uh, uh, generator for it. And we've got fuel uh, depots here. Off to the right of that is a, a pier where a, a ship comes in once a year to give them the, uh, the oil they need. We have to generate our own power for this because first of all, this is out in the middle of nowhere and the Australian power companies couldn't supply that much power to us. And second, uh, this is good uh, US design, so it uses 60 Hertz and Australia is on 50 Hertz, so they, it, we couldn't use their power uh, uh, anyway. Um, here is a blow up end of the central transmitter building with the tower sitting on it like this. And again, this is just from uh, uh, Google Earth. And Here's a picture side view of what that central tower looks like and the base insulator for just one of the, uh, the legs of it. Um, the guy standing that actually kind of shows you what the scale of, uh, of this, this thing is. I'll get to that. So uh, let's see. Come on. No, go back to here to manual. Okay. Remember this uh, Empire State Building? So it's 14. 
57 feet. The central tower there is a little shorter, it's 1,276 feet. But this picture of uh, Manhattan, if you took that antenna and stuck it on the Empire State Building, so it was holding up everything, here's what it would look like. It would span from the Hudson River to the East River. And uh, again, it's, uh, for, um, well, 1,200 feet high, and each of the supporting towers is over 1,000 feet uh, uh, as well. And, uh, but it gives you an idea of the scale of, uh, of this thing. You know, it, at this site, there the, the, the sailors had not, nothing better to do when they were maintaining this thing. They built a model of Manhattan Island with this thing uh, uh, on it like that. Okay, so how does this transmitter work and how big is it? It's gonna have one megawatt output. Uh, and that means it has two megawatts uh, input. This was originally classed as a two megawatt transmitter because uh, in the early days of transmitters until about 1985 or so, they classed the transmitters on the input power to it. So sometimes you'll see it uh, listed as a two megawatt uh, transmitter, but it's actually one mega megawatt of output. Uh, that generator uh, is an eight megawatt generator for the power, which powers the antenna the, or the transmitter and the, uh, the Navy base around it too, and as well as other things. It uses 32 of these uh, iMac air-cooled triodes, which are each um, 80 kilowatts, and they're in pairs, push-pull pairs. And uh, you old guys might know vacuum tube uh, theory, but a push-pull, you have uh, two tubes, and they each operate for half the, the cycle, so you can uh, uh, get more power output, or it's a cleaner power output um, that you can have. And in fact, here's a picture of one, and a guy holding it here. So that's one of the tubes, and they got 32 of these things uh, in there. I told you we don't me mess around with that stuff here. Um, here's a picture of the control console for the, uh, uh, for the transmitter. Uh, lining the wall, around the wall, are the cabinets for, those, uh, for the individual tubes and the transmitter parts. Then behind this guy, you can see there's a, there are a couple of consoles there with little meters on them, so they got a meter for each of the 32 tubes. And then over here is a power uh, cooling uh, for, uh, for the, this thing and uh, some various other um, test equipment uh, for it too. Not quite like your DX60 uh, there. Is it combined here for, for all those tubes? Uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the question was, do you use a combiner for all those tubes? You know, I don't know the exact um, circuit diagram for it, but uh, it is basically that. And they can adjust the power by putting certain of the tubes online or taking them off, too. What's the cost of one of those tubes? Uh, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's big. But uh, they, they send them off to be re uh, re refurbished when, they're, uh, when they've gone bad. So how do you tune this thing? Uh, you tune it just the way you did your DX60 or your Ranger, uh, whatever you have. You've got a, um, um, an adjustable uh, inductor and some capacitors. The capacitors, there are two farad capacitors at uh, 200,000 volts. So these are honking capacitors. And then the, uh, the tunable inductor is this variometer which is like the, the tank coil in your transmitter. And then this other big coil is the RF coil for the uh, um, antenna. And this is just like, you say, a buddy stick or a ham stick, something like that, uh, where you've got a loading coil out at the bottom and then a stick, stick it up. So I got some pictures of these too. Here's a picture of that uh, RF coil. And down, way down there, you can see a guy standing there down here. So this whole thing is about uh, 40 feet high. Uh, and it looked like something out of some science fiction movie with the big power thing coming in here, that big copper tube going up there, and then the power output is going up there. In the ceiling of this transmitter building is this huge knife switch that's hydraulically operated. So if there was ever a short, say, in the antenna, this thing can uh, put the thing over to a uh, dummy load, and it, it is fast, I mean real fast, like half a cycle or something for this thing to uh, uh, activate. The uh, variometer is the tuning device for this. And I got a picture of that if it comes up. So here's a picture of the variometer. And you can see there are two guys wor working on it. Uh, the whole thing's made out of wood, except for the, uh, the coils themselves. And it looks like they're, they're big pipes. But what it is is a stuff called Litz wire. 
L-I-T-Z, and it's a bundle of thousands of little strands of wire. And they do that so that you don't have a skin effect uh, on the, uh, the wire. Otherwise, the, the, um, those, those conductors would be much larger than they are. Uh, the thing is uh, motor control, so there's a shaft going down the bottom of it. And so a motor can tune this thing and uh, make it as resonant as you could hope for with that antenna. The antenna, if you're interested, the uh, radiation resistance of the antenna is about a quarter of an ohm. But still, it's, it's actually quite efficient. It's about, uh, I'd say, upwards of 80% uh, um, efficiency on there. Uh, let's see. Here are some other types of VLF antennas. Uh, we're constrained kind of by geography uh, when we build these things. We have a Navy base and we want to put an antenna there, but they don't have the, the land. So this one in Jim Creek, Washington is built in a big valley. Uh, and it's uh, about a mile across here at the end and about three quarters of, of a mile uh, deep. Uh, this other one on Oahu, it's kind of a junior size. So it's only about three quarters of a mile by a thousand feet, but it's up uh, 600 feet. And the transmitters they have, um, are, are the same as the one you saw uh, before. They're all the standard, maybe one me megawatt uh, transmitter. Now, I had a question here about Cutler. And you ask, is this thing still operational? Yes, it is. So if you go to, again, Google Earth, Cutler, Maine is right up here. And we do have one of these installations there. And if you blow it up, it looks kind of like that. Only this one, it's still got that same type of antenna that's in Australia, but the difference is, it's got two of them, and they're right next to each other. They aren't as big as the one in Australia. These are only a, a mere 1,000 feet, I think, rather than 1,200 feet. But the reason they have two of them is because of uh, weather and icing. Um, if one of the antennas ices up or the antennas ice up, they can uh, shift to their good antenna, and then they just run regular 60 hertz power through the other antenna just to melt the ice. And when the ice melts, then they can shift them back. So right in the middle of the, this whole thing is their transmitter building and then they have coax that uh, uh, connects it to the uh, to helix house under the antenna where they can do the uh, tuning on it so you wonder gee coax for a megawatt what kind of coax is that so here's a picture of the guy standing next to the coax um, and you can see around it he's actually inside another tuned uh, cavity that the coax is inside, so uh, they try to reduce the loss there. But that's the kind of coax you need for a, a megawatt of uh, power, It'd be like LMR fifteen thousand or so, I guess. <laughs> uh, probably no, no. You, uh, you, uh, that would give you a directionality that you don't want. So yeah, you want this thing to be kind of omnidirectional. Now, here this thing kind of sits on this little peninsula that sticks out. And the grounding system for this is 2,000 miles of number six copper wire, again, in a grid, one foot spacing that covers the entire thing and then goes out into the ocean as well to uh, provide uh, uh, grounding for this. So if uh, Tim Duffy ever saw this, I'd say, gee, Tim, you can have fun with your modest uh, system too, but uh, this is what we do when we're serious. Uh, so this whole thing, here's an overhead view of it and show you all the towers Now these towers look a little different and they are because they've got huge counterweights in them uh, again for the icing if the thing starts to ice up the elements will sag down and so these things have these counterweights to kind of absorb some of that uh, uh, sag on them but the whole thing is about four miles uh, from the bottom of the antenna field to the uh, to the top uh, any questions on this so you're thinking that is the biggest antenna that you could ever build. I mean, nothing could be bigger than that, right? Well, not so fast, because now we're going to see the big one. And it's going to make this one look like rubber ducky or uh, handy talkie. The problem is the submarines keep getting better, they keep going deeper and farther away, but we still want to be able to communicate with them. So you remember this chart, it stopped there at um, 10 kilohertz. Uh, but can we go below there? So the Navy did a lot of experiments, and basically what they did, they just put a wire down low in the water, you know, connected it to a big weight, and tried to determine how deep it could go and what they would hear. And what they were hearing on there were static crashes, which they quickly identified as being uh, uh, lightning, uh, thunderstorms. 
but there weren't any thunderstorms within, within a thousand miles. So they kept dialing down the frequency till they uh, uh, lost it. And what they found was we can go extremely low. In fact, we're gonna go, oh yeah, how low can we go? We're gonna go down to 72 Hertz for this thing. Uh, so now we're getting down almost below audio. And wavelength there is uh, almost 2,600 miles. So if you remember a picture I showed you of, uh, remember planet Earth? So here's one wavelength at 72 Hertz, uh, covering uh, a good chunk of the uh, um, radius of, of Earth. Uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> so uh, one thing we might do is say, well, we have an antenna design, that one we use in Australia, why don't, why don't we just scale that? So you divide uh, 20,000 uh, yeah, 20, by 72 and then multiply the uh, dimensions you've got. And what we find is if we use that, we'd have a height of 85 miles and a diameter of 500 miles. So again, even for us, that might be a bit excessive. So what kind of antenna are we gonna use? Well, it's something that hams are very f familiar with. The magnetic loop. Uh, I think a lot of you are familiar with these. The thing about the magnetic loop is the size of it is very much smaller than a wavelength. In fact, usually about, they say about like 10% of a wavelength, uh, and you can operate with this thing. That's the good news. The bad news is this is not really a great antenna. It's very inefficient, and uh, you're going to have a lot of loss, and it is a lot of compromise in this thing, but it will radiate, and that's really what we're uh, interested in. So we're going to use a magnetic loop. Now, the problem, though, is we've got some constraints on this thing. It has to be vertically oriented because, you know, you think, OK, I need a giant loop. I'll just lay this big circle on the ground and that, that'll, that'll work. But it won't work because you're, it's, it's um, directional. And your signal, if you just lay it on the ground, it's either going to go straight up or straight down into the earth. So the antenna has to be um, vertical and with this big circle there. The minimum size we need is 14 miles wide, and five miles high, and that's a minimum. We'd like to have it much bigger. In fact, we'd like to have it 60 miles wide and 10 miles high. So now, how are we going to do that? Uh, so here's our loop sitting on the ground, and we said, okay, it's going to be 14 miles wide and five miles high, and that's clearly beyond our capability. The thing about these frequencies is it doesn't really matter where you put this thing. We can put it up in the air or, come on, there, we can put it down in the ground like that. So now all we have to do is just dig a hole five miles deep or something or be this big tunnel. Well, we don't have to because due to some electrical characteristics, we can have a different uh, system that will actually achieve the same thing without having to dig the hole. So what we're going to do is build a transmitter, our standard uh, one megawatt transmitter, and we're going to extend out the size from there, this dipole. And at the end there, you know, at least 14 miles wide, we just bury the end of it in the ground, put big spreaders in there and, uh, uh, and ground the thing. Now, when we supply our power to it, what's going to happen is it's going to complete the loop down under the earth. So now we've got our loop. Um, it's gonna have some loss though, as you might imagine. So I've got another diagram here. So here's a more of an electrical diagram showing you the various fields. We've got the H or the P there in the transmitter is the power there. And then the H is uh, the magnetic field, H lines. Uh, G is the ground, there's our loop. And the I is the current flowing through there. And this whole thing, 14 miles wide, three to five miles high. Again, that's a minimum. Now, we're going to put a megawatt of power into this thing. Any guesses as to what our effective radiated power will be? You're close, 10, 10 watts, 10 watts out. And you're thinking, what good is 10 watts out? Well, remember. Remember this chart? At 72 hertz, there are no losses. There are no losses in the air. Uh, and even in the water, there are, you know, there are losses, but they're manageable. So the, 
the solution is just pump more power out there. But of course the Navy, they're not satisfied with 10 watts. We need at least a kilowatt. So how many of these things would you need for a kilowatt? Well, let's see, a kilowatt divided by 10 is, you need a hundred of these things. Which now brings us to Project Sanguine. Project Sanguine was a proposal in the 1970s for an ELF array. And I remember seeing news reports on this thing because nobody could believe it. Uh, so I don't know if 60 Minutes did a thing on it, but I know N NBC did. They were having, this was on there frequently. This array, there's gonna be 100 antennas, each of them 60 miles long. And it's gonna be in a grid like that. So we have this huge grid of these antennas, each one 60 miles long, and come on, yeah, each, each one in that red dot is a eight megawatt power plant and a one megawatt transmitter, each one. So total we've got 100, no, 800 megawatts and um, let's see, 100 meg megawatts of uh, transmitter power. This whole thing is going to be 150 miles on, on a size. So the total size is 22,500 square miles. Now, if you took Massachusetts and New Hampshire together, they're only 20,000 square miles. So we have a problem now of where we're going to put this thing. Oh, yeah, I haven't come to the good part. This whole thing is going to be buried underground and hardened to uh, withstand a nu nuclear attack. So again, Cold War, unlimited money, let's charge ahead. So as the real estate agents say, what's the most important thing of real estate? Location, location, location. Where are we going to put this thing? We have some constraints on this. It's the first one. It's got to be on US territory. It's got to be, let's see, here we go, old and stable bedrock. No earthquake faults. In fact, the, the rock they want is this stuff called Precambrian. You know, you have the various eras of the Earth, the Jurassic periods and the Triassic and all this. Cambrian is where life first appeared. So they want this bedrock laid down before life appeared. And there are places in the U.S. where we do have uh, places like that. Uh, we'd like it to be on flat land just to, so it's easy to build on. And we'd like it to be sparsely populated, although that's not a big deal for us. But uh, you know, uh, it causes less political problems if it is. So, we, of course, the thing comes, uh, uh, comes to mind, should we build this in tech Texas? So the Navy went down to Texas and said, hey, you've got this great idea for uh, um, 6,000 miles of antennas, eight, you know, 800 me megawatts of uh, power and all that. And uh, we'd like to put it in West te Texas. So the Texans said, well, there are three problems with that. One, we got cattle out there, and then we got all these oil fields so that would interfere with that. And we've also got a Second Amendment. So the Navy said, okay, we'll go somewhere else. So where do you think they went? Close. Wisconsin. They went up to Wisconsin and said, we want to build it there. And the proposal was, which went before Congress, is they're going to put the grid right there. <laughs> Save your laughter for what's coming here. So it's going to cover 40% of the land area of Wisconsin. You know, what do they have up there? Just cheese and, and the Packers, you know, so who cares? Uh, 800 me megawatts, 6,000 miles of antennas, all buried underground and uh, able to withstand a, uh, a, nu a nu preemptive nu nuclear strike. So they went to Congress in Wisconsin and said, he got a great idea. What do you think? And their answer was, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And we say, hey, look on the bright side you will never have to shovel snow again because the snow is just going to go come down and it's going to be boiled off and even then they said now nah, we don't want to build this they said go back and design something else so the navy went back and next thing was project seafarer which was a reduced array and that didn't get by either so finally after a few more years went by they came up with project elf for extremely low fre frequency and this was built what they did they went out to uh, about the same place, but with a greatly reduced array. And it was built in 1989. And they built it in two sites. Here is a map showing, uh, here's uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, and this is the upper peninsula of Michigan. And there's some uh, federal uh, forests up there where they built this thing. And you can see on the right uh, where it says uh, Copper County, uh, there are three red lines there where the antenna arrays were. 
you know, on the left is Clam Lake, and there's a, just a cross. Now the um, uh, construction of these um, and the the site or the, how the antennas were placed, there's no real meaning for that. They just they put them where they could uh, based on uh, existing land permissions and all that. So they uh, they try to get some uh, omnidirectional uh, coverage from them. But the size of them then, uh, the one on the left at Clam Lake was 26 miles total uh, with the two cross, and the one on the right was 56 miles. In fact, that long red line there, that's the Boston Marathon, six miles long uh, for the, uh, the long one with the two other cross. So going to Clam Lake, um, you can see it's got that cross, and so I got a picture of this thing. This is the transmitter site for that. And you can see here's the transmitter building. And then off to the left is one kind of stripe there and then another one underneath. So those are those who crossed uh, uh, antennas. And this is the antenna itself. It looks just like power lines on, on telephone poles, uh, which is essentially what it was. But they're carrying uh, a megawatt of power. And they're just regular, I think they're just regular pine poles that were uh, holding these, uh, these wires up. Now, at 72 hertz, the bandwidth is about maybe 2 hertz or so on a good day. But you've got atmospherics and there are other problems too. So the data rate on this thing is pretty slow. Uh, we're talking about words per minute. We're talking about minutes or hours per word. Uh, it used a scheme called minimum phase shifting, where you have a, like a sine, but a sine wave, but it's very slowly um, changing fees so they could uh, uh, send the signal in that way. And you figure, hey, what good is this? What kind of messages can you send? Well, the only thing you needed was this bell ringer. There were only two messages this, this thing had to be able to send. First message is, everything's fine. Keep on doing what you're doing. And the other message is, something's happening. Come up higher and find out what it is. But at the end, it didn't last long because the people didn't like it up there uh, it made them the it made them ground zero for the first nu nuclear strike for one thing so there was a lot of unrest about this and there was an activist group that would go out and with chainsaws and cut down those poles while they're you know cutting down a pole with a megawatt of power on and then when the thing came crashing down they would uh, chain themselves to the stump of the uh, tower and just to be uh, arrested and it just got to be that it was just too hard to uh, keep this thing going and the cost of it was outweighing the benefit that we were uh, getting from it. So at the end, it was just decommissioned to 2004. So this is what it looks like. Hey, remember that picture you saw before? That site is just bare land now with the two stripes there um, on it. And if it were really necessary to have this thing, the Navy would have still put it there. But Technologies has improved, so they don't need it anymore. But when I ask what they do now, I've been out of this business for 20 years or so, so I don't really know. You could probably look it up on uh, Wikipedia and find out. So that concludes the lecture. Here are some references for you. You can find all this stuff on the web. Um, go to Wikipedia and look Wollen Weber or Project Sanguine or, or just VLF. Uh, go to Vox.com and do a search on Project Sanguine, the article there on, on how this thing worked. Um, Google the biggest little antenna in the world. That's all about the place in Cutler, Maine. They've got pages and pages of pictures there that show you uh, uh, the construction of, of this thing. And then, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so interesting. They. Uh, uh, they have to do exercises there um, where they uh, uh, simulate that the, uh, those big towers have elevators in them so they can get up and down and do maintenance, but they have to simulate that the elevator is broken. So they have to climb up with a stretcher and rescue a guy who's trapped at the top of it and then lower him down a thousand feet or so. Uh, for the one in uh, um, Australia, but once a year, they have to lower the whole thing down to the ground and do maintenance on the, the wires. So they hire the town, you know, the civilians to come out and help them uh, do, do that. Well, they lower this thing down, have a big picnic uh, for them. But everybody in the town works uh, for the uh, for the base there uh, anyway, because there's nothing else around there. Uh, interesting too. There's uh, there's no growth, you know, no trees or anything. But there are big herds of kangaroos there. 
So the kangaroos come to the station and um, wherever the sun is, they sit in the shadow of all the towers there. And as the sun moves around, the, the shadow moves, these kangaroos just hop uh, around to stay in the shadow of the, uh, the tower. Uh, the last one, QSC October 1961, has a big article on the uh, Butler site as well. And that's where I got that picture of the guy with the coax who was out of that uh, uh, QSC article. Uh, so that concludes the, uh, the briefing. Any, any questions or questions online? Oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yes, that's still quite uh, reliable, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have the faintest idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, the question was, did they use any of the di digital modes, say, that Joe Taylor had uh, invented? And I don't really know. They, um, the, they are improving the um, uh, modes that they use, but basically the, the transmitter is still the same uh, that uh, they, they have there. But as far as what they are, they're putting on there, um, I think the baud rate is up, it's either 300 or 1200. So it's a, it's a medium, uh, medium rate thing. Um, and uh, again, the submariners are used to not being in contact with anybody anyway. So, yeah. Other questions? Do we have any idea what our adversaries uh, Yeah, so the question is, do the adversaries the same thing? Yes, they do. Uh, the Russians, they had a, um, the ELF already. Yeah, uh, the Russians had an ELF array up in Murmansk, operated on 75 hertz, I think. I don't know if it's still in operation or not, uh, but they got the, uh, the same types of uh, VLF uh, antennas, too. So was the yeah. site in, uh, in Wisconsin ever operational to the point where they could verify that it was really dealing with... Yes, it worked. It worked. Yeah, it did. Yeah, but again, uh, it wasn't... It wasn't worth it to for what we're getting out of it. Yeah. Did they market the ELC? Uh, yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Most all the the Navy communication stations are are hardened. Um, uh, for just their normal HSF. Of course, they don't use HF anymore. But now it's all satellites. But they are hardened. Yeah. Other questions? Any anything from people online? And nothing from people online. Okay. Okay. So, so, thank you.